it's it's so tough because you are you are thinking a lot about how can I save money? How can I save money by man, can I room with these people? Okay, we're gonna get an Airbnb and then we're gonna hire a car. And then that like you're organizing you're organizing so much just for like one week of tournament or two weeks of tournaments. And and then you know you're you're counting the money and and you're trying to just not be bleeding. You're just trying to stop the bleeding, all right? You're just trying to stop the bleeding. <clears throat> and then everyone else is sort of in that mindset where you're thinking about the money, and then and then it's you, you play so tight because you know if you win, you can afford a nice dinner tonight, or like you know like <laughs> like I'm not okay. That's a bit extreme, but it's like but you just know that every match is going toward is like it's just so big, you know, it's just so big and. Alright, you ready? I'm ready, man. Alright. Welcome to another episode of Going Pro. And I've been absolutely pumped to do this one live in person with a friend of mine, Lee Two, who's been overseas pretty much all year. We've been keeping tabs a little bit. I've been checking in with your results and just throwing you a few messages here and there, checking in and giving you support. And just, yeah, trying to find a time to to get this going. And I know that there's so much to cover. So I've known you a very long time. We grew up playing against each other. You were a couple of years younger, but you were that good that you were just dominating me and the guys in our age group. I remember training um, at Collin Grove and Broadview, the squads of Martin and Jed. And you being like this tall and just ripping oneies. I'm like, God, this guy was tiny ripping these sick oneies and you made me feel like i was really really bad at tennis because you were half my height and just absolutely murdering me so that was fun and so it was no surprises to me that when you went through you did very well for yourself at a national level you ended up leaving the game um and then you started your own business got back into it you went on a rampage at the utr level transition transition to itf futures and then on to challenges you played australian open you've won rounds at australian open doubles and uh you're on a bit of a wild journey with your tennis so so keen to get stuck in and thanks for being here with us today i'm super pumped to be here uh you know we know we know each other really well for a long time and you know through your story i just remembered that I remember I played you in seniors, I reckon, four or five years ago. And you made a comment like, man, that one-handed backhand has ended careers. And I just started, I just lost it when I was playing you. And uh, no, no, we, we've known each other for a long time. And uh, I'm super pumped to be here. Yeah, fortunately, I didn't take myself too seriously and my tennis too seriously that it made me quit because I very easily could have hung the rackets up on that day. But <laughs> here we are still involved in so tennis. Good. Love it. Um, so as a starting point, I really want to go into why did you walk away from the game? And can you give a snapshot of that time? Were you about 16 years old? It, by um, From memory, you're around 900 in the world. Things on paper looking great, things going well. What made you stop and why did you walk away? Well, I guess it all started when I, when I first started tennis, I was five, six years old and absolutely loved it. There was no expectations. I remember playing for three hours at my in my backyard or at my dad's work. And it was just about how much I loved it. It wasn't about the results. It wasn't about anything. And everything sort of changed when I was about nine or 10. Uh, all of a sudden, I, I made a run at a 12s nationals. I might have made quarters when I was 10. And all of a sudden, people in Tennis USA, Tennis Australia were like, who is this like, Who is this kid? And and then I got thrown into a program and then all of a sudden my dad's like, wait a second, this guy is actually pretty good, like he can play. And from there, it, it, it was a totally different journey. Uh, I didn't unnecessarily fall out of love with it, but all of a sudden it was about winning and losing. It was about, you know, I remember at times when I was growing up, my dad would have a graph of, this is your age and this is where Roger Federer was at your age or <laughs> this is where Nadal was at your age. Nice comparison. And I'm like 14 or 13. I'm like, okay. And and I remember at one stage I was 15 and I didn't have a pro professional ranking and it was like, you know, at this age Nadal's already got some ATP points, you know, and I'm like- <laughs> What are you doing with your life? Yeah, like, like yeah. you know, and I'm like, oh, oh okay. 
and you know, and I can, I can say, this, say this openly with dad because we've got a great relationship and he, he still will say to me, yeah, I made some mistakes with yeah. you when I put way too much pressure on you. Mm-hmm. I remember he would say, you know, you're going to be the first professional tennis player who's also a doctor. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, things like that. And, and it was 100% serious as well. Like 100%, wasn't even, no joke. It was being 100% serious. And, and it wasn't just that. It was, you know, so there was, there was expectation from that side. But also I think at the time, the, the culture or the, what was happening at Tennis SA at the time, uh, it, it was very results driven. Um, I don't want to say it was anyone's error or anything like that, but at the time I really felt pressure and I didn't maybe have the right support network around me at the time to be able to deal with the transition from juniors to seniors. And it was very results driven. And if I didn't get the results, I just thought I wasn't doing very well. You know, my dad sort of saw me probably falling behind the curve a little bit, you know, and the curves being like Roger Federer and Nadal curves. And, and then also, yeah, I just felt I didn't really have anyone in my corner at that time. And it didn't matter from the outside, um, what, how I was doing, but I just felt internally, I wasn't doing good enough. And I hated disappointing my dad. I hated disappointing the people around me. And so one day I just didn't matter. Yeah. One day I just decided to quit and I wrote my email to my dad and say, can you enroll me back into school? Because yeah, I think I'm done. And yeah, he enrolled me back in and, and then I, yeah, I, I, I quit tennis. Yeah. I really appreciate the fact that you can laugh about and you have a really rock solid relationship with your dad about just having to laugh about how things could have been done differently. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah, I, I have a, the same relationship with my dad where we went through that journey together and then we've come full circle and we've spoken about that whole journey and how we, he would have done things differently. I would have done things differently and we can just talk openly about it and actually have a rock solid relationship because mm-hmm. it's, it's something that, I don't know for other sports, but tennis, it's so brutal and it tears families apart. Yeah. Like you see it time and time again. Oh, where sure. Yeah. So many families just getting ruined because of the pressure and the expectation that's put on the kids and, and then the finances involved. And it's just, um, it's not worth it. At the end of the day, you want to make sure that you, yeah. you, you have a loving family and you have that support and that's got to be number one yeah. before anything else. Yeah. Yeah, and for sure, I think you know, for for dad and I, it was it was tough on our relationship at the time uh, because he was, I think, he was also pretty disappointed when I ended up quitting in the end, and I think he was really happy to see me back playing, and then we could have a conversations about what went wrong, what what went wrong from my part, what went wrong from his part, and I just have so much respect for him because you know, obviously, he's a self made self made. Um, man in Australia came over with, with absolutely nothing, didn't speak any, you know, anything, uh, no English, no nothing. So to sort of destroy all expectations, um, and build a fam, like build a family here, build a life for his kids. A lot of people were telling him, no, you can't do this or no, you can't do that. And to exceed and do extremely well, I think, that he saw that for me as yeah. well. He saw that for me as like, no, there's no barriers. Like you can be the first professional tennis player mm-hmm. and doctor. Like doesn't matter who says no, you can't. Like you can do it as long as you work hard enough. And you know, so anything's possible. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's all it's all out of love. Like it's not it's not from any other place. But you just don't understand it when you're that age. And I have parallels in my family. Um, not from my dad, but obviously my nonna nonno who came to Australia with nothing and built the family that we have today. And I get to, and absolute gratitude for myself because then I get to have the opportunities that I have and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to do what I do if it wasn't Mm -hmm. for them. And it's a little bit different that it's directly your dad that came here and started from nothing. Um, Yeah. And I think that would be really, really special Mm -hmm to have that relationship with him and to see how much he's gone through and almost like really almost repay mm. him in a way to just live fully, to know like, wow, like my dad's done this for me and uh, this is an opportunity for me to actually do something with my life and, and reap the rewards that my dad is like almost sacrificed mm. for me to have. Spot on, yeah. 
Um, so how did he actually take that? So when you first, when you quit, um, cause that would have been tough in a way. How, what did he express to you? What was it like, um, in that period when you just said, no, nah, I, I can't do this. Let's go back to school. Yeah, I guess, uh, it was tough for him because obviously I'd, I'd spent a lot of my life making him happy, you know, being good at tennis and being, being the perfect son in a way that my grades were always really good. I was a really good tennis player. Well, I was a pretty good tennis player and and then all of a sudden i've quit tennis i've gone into my studies and i wasn't really studying that hard either and i started to rebel a little bit and i think that was really tough on dad as well because man i've you know, worked so hard have i pushed too much and you yeah. know i've thrown him the, the complete opposite the wrong way and you know he even joked about it at the wedding that all of a sudden oh yeah yeah you're there yeah, and you yeah, know yeah. he's joking about it at the wedding how all of a sudden I would be doing what he didn't want. Like I'd dye my hair, I'd get an ear piercing and, you know, I'd get a tattoo or something. And he was just like, what have I done? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, but yeah, I guess it's, it's through, it's through growth of our relationship. And I think maturity where we could sit down as, as, as men and yeah, just say, 100%. look, I've made mistakes. You've made mistakes. I still love you at the end of the day. And, yeah, let's just grow from it and we can talk about it and moving forward you know he, he comes to my he, i've been at home and he'll come to my tennis and no worries at all i'll listen to his feedback uh and it's it's all good and it makes him happy so yeah it's great mm. yeah was there a particular thing driving that rebellion at that point like wh where was that coming from at that point it was i felt like it was everything was either everything was either okay or it wasn't good enough and i felt like i could never do something and be like yeah that was really good like what you did and i just thought i, I think at some point when i gave up tennis it was just always a constant disappointment if you will i, always, or I could always feel that bit of mm, like uh, you know he should like maybe you shouldn't have stopped playing and yeah. i always felt that energy in a way and i think that that may be you know i if i did my homework and i got a good grade it was like all right that's normal and if not then yeah it was just disappointment and i just thought that i i think i just got caught in a in a cycle of you know what if i can't make you happy then i'm just gonna do me and i'm yeah. just gonna do whatever i want so yeah, yeah. and i got sort of caught into that mentality a little bit yeah mm. Yeah, I think that's teenage angst, to yeah. be honest. Like that, that's pretty pretty normal stuff that, I mean, I went through the same thing. Yeah. And then it, you, you come full circle and realize that you've been a uh, fucking idiot, for yeah, lack, of, lack, of better, <laughs> lack of better term. Um, and then, yeah, like I had a man-to-man -man with my dad at one point as well, and that was, that was a big turning point. Um, was there a catalyst for that where you kind of sat down and, and was there any particular point of, of why you maybe – had had that conversation with dad um i guess i guess it was it's hard i guess in an asian family to to talk about feelings and things like that because a lot of i've, I've learned in a lot of i guess caucasian families a lot of, they really appreciate words of affirmation like we talk about love languages and they really appreciate words of affirmation quality time but a lot of asian parents will show you love by acts of service that's yeah. i'd say it's their number one like love language and it's not you know still to this day I, I could i don't even know if dad's said i love you to me like maybe twice in his life mm -hmm. and but it's but it is hey dad um i need i need uh i need to be picked up from the airport yep no worries tell me what time i'll do it or it will be anything you ask for anything and they'll do it yeah and, and that that is their expression of love and so it is it has been mainly through it, it always has to sort of be me bringing it up and, and then we'll talk a little bit about it but even through the communication or the the communication barriers it is a little bit tougher but i will say that it was a lot of conversations probably with me my brother and my dad where we have just a late night talking about things and about the past or reminiscing and yeah it would just it would just be a five minute like a two minute conversation about it and where we both sort of recognize like, yeah, we, we made some mistakes and yeah. um, yeah, we move on. Cause I know I, obviously I travel a lot,
but yeah, quality time words, it's, it's not really yeah. in the dictionary for <laughs> love languages for Asian parents. Yeah. So it would be like, I, I talk to Kimberly, my wife, I talk to her every day when I'm traveling for 30, 45 minutes. And with my dad, I'll call him maybe once a week or he'll call me once a week. And it's like a two minute conversation. And it's not even, oh, we know we love each other, but it's just, I don't know what to talk about. He doesn't know what to talk about. <laughs> like, yeah, like, that's yeah, it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like, hey, how you going? Yeah, good. Um, how's work? Busy. Okay, great. Yeah, well, good chat. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true, man. It's true. And it's similar for first generation ethnic families as well. Um, yeah, it's so it's so funny. But, but the, at a certain point, you realize that you're not going to get that from them mm. and you actually build a different relationship and you're so appreciative and grateful for the way that they show love mm. and how much they actually really love you as well, which is, which is so beautiful. Mm. So what was the catalyst for you to get serious again? Like at what age through all this period, teenage angst, starting your business, coaching a bit. And then what led to you going like, hang on a minute, I need to, I have some unfinished business to attend to. It's a great question. I think I, I started, I always had an itch to start playing again. So I guess every, you know, Aussie summer rolls around, you see the Australian Open, you see all these players coming in and people you used to play with, things like that. So I'd always have an itch, you know, around January, but then it'd sort of go away for the rest of the year. And th and then all of a sudden I, I, was, I was coaching, threw myself back in there, traveling with some of my players. And I was like, man, I, I really miss this sport. And I always thought, that, you know, I started a business uh, with Ben, really good friend of mine. And I, I was 22 at the, at, the, at, at the time and or 23. And I was, you know, running a business with him and I, I was getting an itch to start playing again. And I thought, man, I, you know, I'm 22, 23. I could be doing this when I'm, you know, in 30 years, eight, 30 years time. Yeah, yeah. And if this is what I want to be doing also, I think I could be better better at coaching if yeah. i was to play if i've got this itch like i think i feel like i should i yeah, should like act hand on in it hand, yeah. yeah and i'll say daniel buberus uh, who was uh, has been on your podcast as well he was a massive reason i will say as to why i started playing again and i am very grateful to him for that because the utls were, were on uh, and i had a bit of an itch to play again and uh, i was playing one of the players that he was working with at the time and we finished the match and he pulls me aside afterwards and he's like, Lee, what are you doing with yourself? And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm coaching and, and, you know, I'm just playing this tournament because I think I can win it and there's pretty good money. And he's like, yeah, he's like, uh, he's like, mate, you still got it. Like, you still got time. Let's, uh, let's have a coffee and we'll talk about yeah. it. I'm like, oh, yeah, all right. And so then, you know, we, we had a sit down at Chibo maybe a week after and we, he was like, Lee, like, do you, do you want to do this? And, and from, just from the look on his eyes, yeah. he like really believed in me. He was like, yeah, dude, yeah. like you can, you can do this. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, no, nah. I, I was like, no, nah, if I'm honest with myself, I do, I do want to play. But there's also a part of me that was also a bit worried about, man, what other people are going to think, you know, I've been away for so long. I already made a little kind of comeback when I was 18 for six months. And then I gave it away again. And, and then I'm going to come back at 24 for the, I guess the third time, like what are people going to say about me? So there was a bit of, there was a bit of, I guess um, resistance, he tension, yeah. hesitation around it. Yeah, exactly. So I was a bit resistant to it as well at the time. Uh, but then, if I was like really honest with myself, I was like, no, like I do, I do want to play, and and I do want to. I, I feel like it's an unfinished story. Like mm -hmm. I feel like I've got more to give. So yeah, we sat down and and we formulated a plan. I still remember the day. It was third of August, twenty twenty, where that was my first day of training, and we had a six week training block together, and he'll help me out through that where you know, everything was structured. I was, you know, hitting this ma this much per week and then we're going to slowly ramp up the hours and things like that. And from there, it, uh, yeah, it started. But I think a lot of it, what helped me was finding my love through tennis, through coaching again. And I all of a sudden was, was loving being on court. I was, I was thinking about other people, how to help them and, just going through their journeys and then it also made me reflect a lot on my own journey and my downfalls and i thought i just learned so many lessons about myself 
through coaching and I really found my love for the game. And yeah, and then I just, I, I loved the kids that I worked with and I thought everything sort of lined up for me to really give it another crack. So mm. what sort of lessons were you learning about yourself in that time? You said you, you were learning a bit about yourself and, and through the kids that you're working with. Yeah, I guess how, how much our our ego or I, I, our identity as tennis players, how good we are, our worth is involved in winning and losing. Yeah. It doesn't matter the score line, doesn't matter anything. It's about that temporary feeling that when we win, man, we're great. Things are great. If we lose, man, we suck. Man, we suck. And that was a big one for me was going through so many wins and losses with players who I thought were great and who I thought... Um, who th- well, yeah, who I thought were amazing, and then for them to really question them themselves as a tennis player after they lose eleven nine in the super tie break, and I'm just like, how are you? Yeah, and then obviously, but I get it. Like I've been there. Like I get it. I get it. But then also another part of me is like, snap yourself out of it. Like what's what, what do you mean? You know, if you won that eleven nine, you'd be coming to me like, man, that was you know that was a great match. I'm so happy I won that. But then you lose eleven nine, and you think that you're a horrendous tennis player. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, like well, how are you having t- so like, such different conversations based off of two points? Yeah, true. And going through that over and over again, um, that really sunk in with me. Uh, and also I think that just hard work and just the one percenters really count. And if you put in work over time, consistent good work over time, that you will reap the benefits of it. Uh, because, you know, coaching... As you know, coaching over years, you see the kids that are doing that little bit extra and over a term, over two terms, they're miles ahead of the guys that don't do those one percenters or that don't train really well every day that they come out. So those were the two, I'd say, main things because, yeah, there was times when I was playing and I wouldn't be doing the one percenters. If it rained, I was pretty quick to be like, yep, let's do nothing for the day. Let's go do something else. And... Yeah, I'd say that that's probably changed a little bit where it's a bit more self-driven this time mm-hmm. where I don't need someone telling me what to be, what to do. I sort of, if I tell myself I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So, yeah. hundred percent. So when Bubris got involved and that was, you had that six week training camp, um, what happened that year? I mean, <clears throat> you went on a rampage through the UTR um, match play or that, that whole series that you went through pretty much all of 2020, right? Yeah. And even into 2021? Yeah. Yep. What what was your record? How, how what did that look like over the year? Yeah, so I guess I I started and I went about thirty three wins and two losses across those like UTR match series in twenty twenty. That's very hard to do, by the way. Yeah, I, I hope people don't think that's normal behavior. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I just went on a, a rampage and and I remember my mentality at the time was I just want to get as many matches as I want possible. Uh, I feel really behind in how many matches I've played. And I just want to get match fit. And I just want to play heaps of matches. What started to happen as that as that process unfolded? So from the start, as it was going through the middle and then towards the end of just those 35 matches, what was changing? What do you feel was happening? What sort of momentum did you, did you feel? And how was your maybe mind changing throughout that whole process? Yeah, I think I, I at the start, I didn't know what to expect. I... All of a sudden, I was, I was, I was winning. I was, I was doing really well. But I still felt zero pressure. I still felt zero expectation. Uh, I didn't even realize until I guess UTR posted my, my, um, my win loss record or whoever posted it, uh, tennis Australia, but I had honestly not paid any attention to it. I, I knew, obviously I knew I was winning a fair bit, but I thought that slowly a bit of what was like, Oh, maybe I could still do it. And then it slowly changed into wait, no, I think I can do this. And, and the, the mentality shifted a little bit into oh i want i'm just gonna from the start it was i'm just gonna give it give it my best for a year or two years and just see what happens into oh wow no i think this is actually a legitimate thing i think i can actually be quite good so because i think a lot of people forget as well that before i came back the most points i had was five points like the most the the best i i did was i was just a good junior and i i maybe yeah had five points i was ranked outside a thousand never been ranked inside a thousand before i started yeah, okay. playing again yeah, yeah. and so i had no idea like what how i would go and to yeah play the utrs play the the caliber of player that i was playing and and winning 
kind of just proved to myself was no, I made the right decision in coming back and really giving it a crack. And I'm so grateful that all the, all the things lined up for me to come back and play. Yeah. Unreal. So from the UTRs, I just want to talk and touch on the money involved because UTR has been a great initiative to actually help players like at your level or people coming back to actually see if they can build some finance and have an opportunity to maybe travel and make some money. Um, so how much were you earning through that whole process? Did you end up saving money um, through playing for basically a year on the UTR circuit? Yeah, I did. I did. So UTR, uh, very, very grateful to them as well because during a time where there was no tournaments on, there were just so many UTRs on. And there were so many players for Australian tennis players having the opportunity to compete, save money for when the ATP or the ITF and the ATP tournaments opened up that we could go and travel and play. And yeah, the money was the money was great. The The travel expenses weren't crazy. The travel expenses were fine because we we're only traveling interstate. And yeah, the money when you when you won was was great. You know, it was around forty five hundred dollars or forty five hundred dollars if you won one. And then if Australian you, or US? Australian. Yep, yep. Which then, is more to put that into context. That's more than what you get for winning a professional ITF. Yeah, fifteen k. Yeah, it's about the same is, as a twenty five k. That's mental. Yeah, yeah. Like, can yeah. we wrap our heads around that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for a professional tournament that you're earning, well, it's so hard to win five matches yeah. in the main draw to win a fifteen k or twenty five k. Like, yeah. not many people get to do that. Yeah. And then the worst prize money is even like six hundred or seven hundred dollars Australian. And if you lose first round of the fifteen k, you're getting two fifty, three hundred, uh, and that's you go through qualifying and you lose first round and you're picking up like a three hundred dollar paycheck. And with UTR, you just rock up uh, and you're getting six hundred, seven hundred minimum. Mm. Um, so yeah, and that's coming dead last. So that's. Yeah, it's, it was a really good, I think, initiative at the time for competitive match play in Australia. And yeah, it, they really helped me in my career, which is why I'm an ambassador for them because they, number one, gave competition during a time which was really hard. The, the prize money was great and we were getting five, six matches, competitive matches a week, which is, man, if you lose first round, then it's like five, six weeks worth of matches. Mm. Um on the ITF or the ATP tour. So yeah, it was great. Yeah. So then that catapulted you to actually get a wild card into the Australian open, right? Yeah. So you did so good on that circuit and then basically got gifted that through that process. Is that how it unfolded? What was that process? It was, it was absolutely crazy. It won't happen again. It was an absolute, it was crazy. So I, so this is what happened. So I, I'd honestly, I'd say that time, that period from August 2020 to end of August, uh, end of 2020 was the hardest I've ever worked in my life. And it was because I was coaching full-time pretty much. And then I was also training full-time pretty much. Like I was doing a lot and, and Daniel and Ben, they can account, they, they can account to that because they knew what my, what my timetable was at the time, but it would be, Daniel would tell me, you know, you've got, you've got to do three hours of hitting today and a bike session. And then along that, I've got to try and fit in my coaching around that, like a full-time coaching schedule around that. And it would be like a Monday, I could be coaching from seven to 8.30. And then I've got to train, I'm going to hit from uh, nine to 11, have a bit of a break, uh, hit from let's say two to three, and then I'm going to coach from three to eight. And then after eight, you know what, Daniel, I told you I'm going to do a bike session. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to do that bike session because I was always very big of a, um, I was a stickler for making sure that the program was done no matter what. And then I, yeah, do a bike session at nine at 9 p.m. at the gym or something, finish that, yep, done boobs. Um, and then the next day, and then it would be like that. It was like that from August, 2020 to end of August. Yeah, it's giving me Rocky vibes right here. Yeah, no, but it was like, but at the time, at the time, I didn't realize how crazy my, at the time I didn't realize how crazy my work and training schedule was. Cause I just thought that that, that was normal. And it's not until now I'm like, man, I just I was like, man, that was a that was a crazy period of my life. When you're in that zone, you're in that zone though. Yeah. There's nothing like it when you get in those pockets. It was crazy. And then I played, I played, so the last UTR was Sydney, and that finished around 22nd of December, I'm gonna say. And I had some good wins. I had I had some good wins there. And I remember around that time they were picking Australian Open qualifying wildcards. And 
it wasn't even on my radar at all. And then I get a call and they were saying, yeah, look, um, there's, uh, there's some wild cards. And if these two people, if, if this person gets in, then I think Boucher is going to get it. And then if this other person gets in, then you're going to get it. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, I was like, are you serious? And I was like, okay. And, and, then it, uh, and then as it turns out, the second person, I can't remember the, who, who it was, the second person didn't end up getting in. So they got the wild card. So then I didn't get one, but I was like sort of next in line to get one. Uh, so when that happened, I remember I took, I took three days off. I took three days off and I was like, man, that felt, that feels like unreal. Cause like, I just, I, I hadn't taken, I'd barely taken a day off. And I took three days off. I went with, um, I remember I went with, uh, I think Darren, um, to, to his like house in Manham or something like that. And I just had a bit of a, just a weekend off and it was great. And then, and then, so then they go ahead with the Australian Open qualifying, they finish it and I, I get, and then I see an article, something about, yeah, Murray's gone COVID on his way over from wherever he was from England to Australia. So his wild card's gone and they don't know what to do with it. And then at the time I'm, and then at the time I've, I've gone to play a UTR in Bendigo. There was two UTRs in Bendigo and I'm, and one of the names on the list was Mark Polman's and he was, I think, I think he was 120 at the time and yeah, he was playing it. And we ended up playing each other in the final and he got a main draw wild card. I reckon it's like probably the first one because obviously he's 120 in the world. And we played on the final and I think this is where, yeah, it, it was crazy. But I remember I was 6-4 down, 2 all, love 40 on my serve. And I'm just like, man, okay, I'm getting destroyed. <laughs> like, and then I ended up winning that match 4-6 uh, and then 6-3, 6-2 after that. And I just played lights out. And then after that, I'm still enrolled in the I'm still enrolled in the UTR for the following week. So because there was two in a row, and so that was the first one. And then the second week, uh, and then I get a call after the match, uh, like later that night or the day after, from Wally Masur, and he mm -hmm. says he says, Lee, uh, we've uh, we've decided to give you a wild card into the 250 um, for the the week before Australian Open main draw. So it didn't really tell me anything about the, the main draw. So. So I played, got a while into that. I played, played Pedro Souza. He was maybe 105 in the world. I lost six, four, seven, six, uh, seven, five, yeah. And I was maybe five, two up in the second set serving for it or something like that. And I ended up losing that match. And yeah. And then after that, I feel like I kind of just showed enough where they were like, yeah, well, no, we're going to give it to you. Cause we think you've got, I don't know, but they, you know, they said, we, I think we, we think you've got a great chance of winning first round of Australian open main draw. So yeah, so that's how it sort of all unfolded. Um, and yeah, cause it was either, I don't know, I think it was either they had to have to give it to an Australian or they had to give it to the next lucky loser or something like that. And then, yeah, I guess they ended up giving it to me and I'm obviously, yeah, it was just an absolutely crazy story. And, you know, there's a lot of arguments on whether or not I should have got it, someone yeah. else should have gotten it. And it was pretty controversial at the time, yeah, which I, I say. which I totally, I totally understand. I can see it from that lens as well. Yeah. yeah, which I totally understand because it's like, man, this guy's been back playing for five months and he's going to yeah. give him like an Australian Open wild card. No ranking as well. With no ranking. Yeah. And I, I totally get that. And it's, I guess yeah, it would have ruffled some feathers, but you did also deserve it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like it was a ballsy move for them to give you the wild card, but if someone did deserve it for the work that you put in and the record that you showed in that year, yeah, like it, it does stand. Yeah, yeah. I get, yeah, they were like, they were, you know, I remember when they first announced that I got it. People were telling people around me were telling me, like, shut your phone off, don't don't look at your phone. Yep. you know, it's probably gonna this probably gonna be pretty controversial, things like that. And but it was great for my team around me to really support me, and um, and then yeah, I ended up I ended up playing that match, and I played. A great match. I lost in a tight four setter. Yeah, against and, Lopez, right? Yeah, against Lopez, and it was great from Craig Tiley as well after the match to say, you know, we make a lot of hard decisions, you know, doing this job. But it was great for, to get the, I guess, affirmation from him to say, but yeah, I think we made, like, yeah, I'm glad we made the right decision. Give it to you. Mm -hmm. So it was very controversial, and I guess it's not up to me to say if they made the right or the wrong decision. But I guess. It, it, it is what it is and at the end of the day it is a wild card no one really deserves a wild card yeah. it's it's all uh yeah it's it is what it is so yeah the yeah. wild card's an interesting one yeah it is it's uh, it's gifted. a double-edged sword i would say um so it's it's yeah 
Yeah, what I want to ask you from that is the prize money in a first round of a, of a Grand Slam is fantastic. I mean, mm. was it ninety thousand dollars at that at that point, or hundred thousand around? It's a hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. So, what did you do with that money? Did you use it to set things up? Was there? A, did you kind of structure it in a way where you like kind of set up your next phase of your tennis using that? How did you actually? use that to benefit or catapult your tennis career forward uh yeah so straight away i I put it away i am yeah again i'm not the person to spend money on a car or anything like that or a fancy car or i put it away and i said this is for tennis and Mm -hmm. this is a gift and it's a gift where this is for tennis i'm going to put it towards my tennis invest in myself and yeah and, and that and that was it like i i i just said this is going to go towards my travel it's going to go towards a coach or towards fitness training anything but it's just going to go towards my tennis and i think yeah everyone that has known me since that time would agree with that uh i don't i haven't i think i haven't bought anything crazy i haven't done anything so all i've done is still driving that that rav yeah still driving (laughs) that that rav4 passed down you know like generations so i'm i'm not yeah i'm just not like that and i uh, yeah, it just went straight towards, tw- straight towards my tennis. So is, yeah, is is that money is Grand Slam money taxed? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but they give it to you, and then you do your own tax. Okay. But in other countries, they they will tax it. Okay. Yeah. Mm, fascinating. So from there, you jumped on to the futures tour. Like how how soon after did you actually go? Because then you went to Montecia, mm. um, and you didn't have a ranking, and that crazy in that little swing in Montesia, Tunisia was wild as well. So yeah. how long after was that? When did that unfold? Yeah. So I guess I, after that tournament, I, uh, I, it was sort of just still during COVID. So COVID was still lingering around and my, my mom's health wasn't great. It was okay, but it wasn't great. Like she had been diagnosed with lung cancer a while ago. And at this stage it was sort of getting a bit more aggressive and I, I honestly didn't want to travel. Like I, I didn't know how much time that she had. And so I found it hard. I found it hard to travel at that stage. So then I was staying home and a lot of people didn't know that as well. So they were a bit judgmental on me to not, to not travel after Australian Open because they're like, man, this guy's played, you know, Australian Open really well. He's got the money. Like, why isn't he leaving? And yeah, and I guess it was a bit tough for me at that stage because, and also I didn't quite get the tennis tour. I think at that stage, like I hadn't quite thrown myself in there yet, so I didn't really know what I was missing out on with all the tournaments going on. But yeah, there was a lot going on at home where I just didn't know with my mom's health how long she'd be around, and I was like, you know what, I want to, I want to stick around. And so I, I decided to stick around, and I played UTRs for seven months or so and it got to the stage in august where i had to sit down like multiple sit downs with my family and was like man should i go you know chen and uh, should i go i remember going to doctor's meetings with my mom and saying like you know i'm a tennis player i want to go is it okay for me to go uh and the doctors couldn't really give me an answer because they wouldn't be like yeah no you're right to go and then if something happens like they're live you know that you know i'm like you told me it would be all right so you know they weren't really giving me answers my family were still, you know, I think they were keen for me to go, but also it was hard. It was hard for me personally to go. And it wasn't, and it was, I think it was, yeah, it took about seven months being on the sidelines of, you know what, there's never going to be a good time to go. There's never going to be a good time to go. So yeah, it took, it took me leaving in August again. So August, 2021. So I didn't play a professional tournament for seven months after Australian Open. Mm. So it took, me being in August, having a sit down with, with my dad, mom, Chen, uh, and saying, oh, and I get, yeah, and, and Kimberly and, and saying, yeah, there's never going to be a good time to go. Like, and then them all supporting me saying, yeah, like, yeah, we all think you should go. So, so then I was like, all right, I'm going to go. So I made that call in August, 2021 and yeah, decided to do a, a, a futures tour in Monastir and in France and did it with four amazing guys and we're all very, very, very close mates. And yeah, it went extremely well. I mean, I, I played nine futures. Uh, I won four of them. 
made uh, made a couple semis as well and yeah i had no ranking from zero to i think i was like 520 in nine tournaments so it was very successful and blew all expectations out of the water i mean from zero from zero points i played my first tournament from pre qualies which people were like the tournament director and people still laugh about that story where i had to qualify to get into qualifying for my first tournament and yeah i ended up winning that tournament i got 10 points from from that tournament that's like more points than i've ever had in my life and yeah just from my first tournament and yeah i think i i still i'm still wrapping my head around how quick it all sort of happened where before i started playing it i mean i'd gotten five points like the most i've had and i just had no expectations honestly and yeah and it was it was yeah it was crazy what was the tennis like that you're playing at that point how would you describe it when you're in that zone winning that many matches winning these futures it's it's crazy because you kind of get into the mentality of like winning winning becomes a habit and i guess just as much as losing it can become a habit as well but i just I would honestly walk onto a court and didn't matter what the score was. I could be down a set and four one or something, but I still think I'm going to win. And it, it's a pretty crazy feeling when you're, it doesn't matter what situation you're in. You're just thinking in the back of your head, like, nah, like I'm going to win this match. And yeah, I just felt that I had an extreme confidence. I felt that, yeah, I, I don't really know how to describe it. I just had so much confidence in my game and the work that I'd put in that, yeah, I was just on absolute cloud nine. I was playing unbelievable tennis and also got to the stage where, yeah, I would lose. If I, if I did lose, I, I just didn't care. I'd be like, nah, it's all good. Like I know, I'm, I know, I'm, I know I'm, I know I'm playing good. I know I'm good enough to, to make it at, at that stage. And uh, yeah, so. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> That was crazy to see that unfolding from the sidelines. That was, yeah. yeah, that was a cool time. So from there, you did the Australian swing as well. And just being on the future circuit for maybe just under just under a year. What did you observe? What, um, what did you really take away from the future circuit? What, what stood out to you of good, bad, ugly? Um, what were some of the key learnings and observations through that time? I just say that now, I'd say uh, nowadays, there are so many tennis players, so many male tennis players, and female but so many tennis players that are really good that have a lot of talent and i'll say that the futures tour that they can all play they can all play good tennis on the day but i think it's the consistency in it i think it's the 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 attitude i will say is like the emotions there, I feel like they're a lot more emotional and they I can sort of tell if they're winning or losing. I feel like the work ethic isn't as much and I don't want to bag futures players or anything like that, but I will, uh, but I think that the key differences are, is the consistency in attitude, work ethic, um, and just emotional, I guess, stability, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, and then the challenges and, and then, then the challenges, it's another step up, but then the ATP tour, it's another step up and yeah. And that's something that I'm still growing in and still growing in my emotional maturity when I'm on the court, trying to be as stable as possible, trying to work hard. I'm always trying to be a better version of myself. And I think we're all on this journey to be the best versions of ourselves. I won't say I've got it all figured out cause I definitely don't. Uh, but I will, but. Yeah, just from observations, I would say that those three things are, are, are pretty big from the futures level to the ATP tour. And I think it's like a gradient across the board on average that, yeah, that the work ethic and the attitude and the emotional maturity just seems to get better as you sort of go up, yeah, up the ranks. 100%. I haven't had too much exposure um, at a challenger level and at just a little bit of future, but just from my observations, it seems to be yeah on the money from Mm. from what i'm seeing you've become religious in recent years so i'm curious to know were you religious growing up what's how did this come about was there any particular catalyst that uh that led you to become religious yeah uh well i guess i guess my family they they weren't really religious or my dad had some 
some my like not my but it's like some chinese ancestral beliefs sure so it was always a little bit in my family uh and i guess it all it, it changed a lot when my mum got sick and she started reading the so one of her friends started uh brought the bible over and she started reading the bible every day and and then she came to and then she told the family she's like yeah i'm christian now and me and my mom we've always, we've always been extremely close and and i was, and i always felt i guess drawn to christian people honestly like i loved their energy i loved i loved what they were about and i always thought there was something different about them and it's not and i'm not going to say all christian people are good because they there's they're not we're all still you know but there were some that I could really feel that they were Christian in their heart and they had just had really good values. And I could, you know, I was just so drawn to those, to those people. And yeah, I think mom being sick and her being Christian was a huge catalyst for me to start asking those questions and to go down that path of, yeah, reading the Bible, going to church and Kimberly as well. So she's, she was, uh, she's Christian and she was Christian all her life and her going to church as well and then bringing me i think helped me on that journey of discovering my faith and it was it was a big catalyst for me i think mum getting sick and also kimberly my wife her bringing me and encouraging me to go and explore explore my faith explore the christian life and yeah that that's probably been a huge a huge part of my life honestly it's it's big in my decision making my daily decision making any big decisions we always bring god into it mm. and yeah it's a it's a huge huge part of my life that's amazing so how do you feel like you've actually changed as a person from the lee before being a christian and then the lead that's now on this path being a, a christian for a, a few years now i guess it's it's huge for me in a way that it, it's it's humbling to say i don't have it all figured out mm. And I don't have it all together, and that's why, and that's why I've God, and I've God to, to, uh, I can model. I want to try and model my life, live like Jesus, and I don't, and I don't try and pretend like I've got it all sorted. Or as you know, before I think I tried to rely a lot on myself and my own strength, and I think it's it's been very big for me to have my faith and have a lot of the outcomes and stuff predetermined if you will by god and by by higher power if if you're religious or if you're not um and i think that that has been such a driving power for me in also not my in my life but also my tennis as well Mm. as to to be able to live and be playing tennis and be like man this is not the biggest thing and there was you know that i went to church last week and they were talking about the eternity effects of how when you have eternity in your mind, in your perspective, that our time on earth is so minuscule and it is so not necessarily meaningless, but it is it is so small in the in the perspective of eternity, where if you can have that perspective in your life while you're here on earth, that you can live so freely and you can live so grateful of everything and to be grateful of the time here, just knowing that there's another destination, I guess in mind and yeah i kind of forgot what your favorite your question was but i just started rambling there that was that was a great ramble no i I got mad respect for anyone that has any religious beliefs spiritual beliefs believes in some sort of higher power i think it gives meaning um Mm, and context on our human experience um i think we can get really wrapped up in the earthly experience that we have and just think like this is it and there's like maybe no uh, other uh, experience out there and we can close ourselves off yep. and think that we have all of the power when i think it can be important Wh- whether it's true or not true just having that belief mm. Mm. and be- feel like you are being guided uh, i think helps give you a sense of gratefulness that you said humbleness helps you relieve anxiety about mm. the angst of the pressures of mm. being being human as well um, and just gives you like something to grab onto and anchor which, yeah. I, which I think is just so important yeah. whether regardless of whatever you believe in which religion or whether you just have a universal belief 
yeah. on some higher energy. Like it actually doesn't really matter in my opinion. I just think all of it's leading towards similar things and teaches you some fantastic values. Mm. And I can see how that would have actually really helped your tennis. Like, mm. do you feel like when you're on court, you've been like guided or you have some clarity or you have some like kind of faith to help you through the hard times or help you navigate challenging situations, being in a high pressure situation like tennis, for example? Yeah, I think that I think that at times because I'm a born again Christian, so I am still quite new quite new to it and my faith is sometimes sometimes I feel my relationship with God is really good. Sometimes I feel like and it is very hard on the road especially. I will say that you know when I'm in, when I'm in Adelaide, I'm going to going to my home church every Sunday. I feel so grounded in God and who I am and and then when I start traveling my my bible readings or my prayer time gets a little bit interrupted i don't feel that close to god at times and you know i'm very open with uh, to kimberly about that and i will say that when i do feel closer to god it's not necessarily like okay i'm feel closer to god so i'm going to win heaps of matches you know and i'm going to feel divine energy running through me it's it's not <laughs> like me, baby. yeah it's yeah. it's not like that it's it's more you know what you know what there there are God's with me and he wants the best outcome for me. And if it is to win this tennis match, then great. And if it's to lose, it's not. And I guess to have that comfort and comfort in knowing that um, is is great. And I think that a lot of the times when I play tennis, I remember when I first started as well, when I first became Christian, I felt really cold to play tennis and to almost glorify God in that. And, you know, to go on tour and to show people that, man, there's something different about Lee. Like, I don't know what it is exactly, but... Yeah, let's have a conversation about it. And a lot of times I, you know, I try and glorify God in that and say, man, I just, I'm so happy. Like, I'm so grateful to be playing tennis. I'm so grateful that it's a great life that, you know, that I can do my gift and be happy with, about it. And man, it's like, Lee just lost like seven, six in the third, but like, how's he still smiling? You know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's because it's all good. Like, I know, you know, I know where I come from. I know where I'm going and I'm just grateful to be here and to be playing what I feel like I'm called to be doing at this time. And yeah, I think that that is just such a huge part of my career, of my tennis, of my almost keeping my sanity in a yeah. way because it is such a brutal sport when you look at the win-loss ratios and everything like that. But if you can put it into perspective of eternity or of what at least what I feel like I'm called to do, then yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear, my man. It's <laughs> um, it's important because it does give you that feeling of like it's all okay either way. Yeah. And whatever's meant to happen is yeah. is meant to happen. And I accept that. And I accept that of part of the journey mm. in whatever my, my faith is. Do you find it hard to navigate and talk to some people about? Because I feel like some people get really maybe touchy or not. Maybe don't know how to tackle. A little bit uncomfortable when it comes to this sort of stuff. Yeah. How do you go about that? Do you just like keep it private? Um, do you just like do your thing? And if anyone wants to know anything, mm. you just kind of then maybe open up aside from that. You're not really saying too much or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I am pretty private about it. I, I, and that's something I, I am working through, to be honest. I, I sometimes am a bit ash- not ashamed, but there is a sense of shame sometimes of my faith because it is so different and it is just not, it's not what tennis plays are, are usually about, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm, you know, uh, I try and live like the wholesome life, if you will, you know, and it's it's something sometimes that I, I shy away from my faith a little bit at times in public settings because it is just so different and I don't want people to, I almost want to protect protect myself. I don't want to open up and say this is what I'm about and then people start tearing me down because of it because I also don't know who I'm talking to but if I'm in a in with some close mates and you know they respect me I respect them I I talk you know very openly about it but I also don't want to be very pushy and try and almost convert other people like mm-hmm. I'm just very happy doing me but if you're really interested in what I'm about then I will talk about it very happily and talk about um yeah my faith but yeah, I'm not really public. I'm not really public about it. I don't really, yeah, say it to everybody that I come across with. So yeah, but that is something that I'm working towards, and I do want to be a bit more open about it because uh, I do think at times I am a little bit 
standoffish with it because mm-hmm. I just don't want to be ridiculed for it, I guess. No, yeah. I understand. I hear you as well. Yeah. Um, it's a weird one because you said like tennis players, they're not really about it, but I just think why aren't, I feel like tennis players could be so much better if they did have some sort of spiritual connection or some sort of belief or some sort of faith to grab onto, especially in something that is so cutthroat and challenging and high demand pressure like the game that we play. Uh, I feel like it's a, it's a missed opportunity for a lot of people that I think um, they could get really a lot of value out of and it doesn't have to be Christianity. It could be anything, yeah. um, whatever, whatever mm-hmm. that is or whatever works for the individual. Yeah, I agree. How did this lead into the journey with your mum? So your mum, your mum passed last year. Yeah. And you went to Korea in that time. Now you ended up winning that tournament. And obviously, like, I don't know the ins and outs of what happened. I got to watch a little bit of your semifinal and the final where I think the semifinal you played Duckworth. Uh, right? Yeah, I did. Yep. Duckworth yep. that you won and then um, in the final against Yi Bing Wu. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we all know what sort of year Yi Bing Wu's had and like ended up making well, around top 50, close to. How, what was that like through that period where your mom was transitioning, she passed, you went to Korea, just felt like and looked like you were in a different zone? Like, yeah. Where did you go and how did you end up? getting the win that week at a challenger level, which was a huge milestone for you. Can you talk us through what that whole experience was like? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that uh, I'll go into detail about that period of my life, I guess, because it was, it was so crazy. So I, uh, I, I started playing challenges in June. I went to a US and I really struggled. I really struggled and didn't really get any results. I was struggling and I come back. And on the flight over, or I booked my flight, I've told my family, oh, yeah, I'm coming home. And then my brother tells me, just so you know, mom's health has deteriorated a lot since you were last here. Jen, we don't want you to be surprised. Sorry, we kind of kept it from you, but we didn't want you to be distracted with your tennis. But just so you know, um, yeah, her health is really bad. So, and then I ended up getting, I booked the flight and I'm getting lucky loser into main draw. And I was like, wow, okay, so I've got to play so I, my, my, my brother just told me that this morning and then I got to play later tonight. Play that match, absolutely tanked. Like, I don't take tennis matches, but that one, I, I was not there. Yeah. Like I just played and I was out of there. Like, Completely fair. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I played that match and I left. Uh, and I left. So got back and I, I took, I, 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 there was some tournaments in Australia, but I decided to take them off and I was home for about eight, nine weeks during that whole time. And I was just training. I was seeing my mom a lot. I was, you know, doing her exercises. I was still pretty hopeful that that she could get better. And, you know, I was trying to help her walk or do little things. And so that was really special to kind of go through that with her. And I had a wedding in, on the 25th of November planned. But I got back in August and my, my brother said to me, Lee, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think she's going to make it to your wedding. And uh, that made me and... That made me and Kimberly rethink the big the rethink the big wedding. So we decided to have a really small one with just family, which is really special on the third of September. I'm gonna say, and that was the last day that my mum walked. Um, actually, so that was the last day that she walked, and I remember that day she was super happy, and she kind of said at the end of the wedding to to dad that you know that I, my my almost like her purpose on earth was done. Like she was content to, wow, to leave, um, yeah. which was pretty big. So yeah, that, like, I remember like later that afternoon, she was talking to dad and saying, man, she's had the best day. You know, like, you know, we, we, our job as parents is done. Like I can, I'm happy to leave and stuff. And yeah, that was pretty special. And then, so that was 3rd of September. Um, and, and she passed away on the 24th of September. So three weeks later, she passed away. And I think it was maybe about, Honestly, I remember it was a Saturday, the third, like we had a wedding on a Saturday and that following Thursday, mum had a massive decline in her health. Like it was the one where, the one where if she eats any more food or drinks any more water, it's going to go straight to her brain um, and then she's going to actually pass away quicker. So she couldn't, so from that following Thursday, she, she couldn't eat, she couldn't drink, um, 
we she was just we just kind of had to be by her side until she passed away so that was sort of like a, a big point for for kimberly for the whole family to be like wow like you know she's only here for a couple more weeks or you know uh, and that was a big that was a big moment and 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 i remember you know we spent a lot of time there by her bed and yeah by her bed and it was a really tough period and yeah i remember saying you know i remember her saying to me um like i'll i'll i'll, I'll see you in korea because she knew my schedule and she was like i'll see you in korea and uh yeah that just that just got me good and uh you know and and uh, so she passes away on the 24th of september and we have the wedding no not the wedding sorry we have the funeral a week later on a friday and i've got a flight this saturday so yeah friday and then the next day i'm on a flight to korea and a lot of the time and i didn't really tell anyone what was going on i didn't want people to know i kind of just wanted to just do my thing and yeah, so I leave on Saturday, and I remember telling I remember telling Kimberly, I was like, some I feel like something special is going to happen in Korea. I don't know why, but I just I just feel like something special is going to happen. And yeah, so we go. So I go on I go on the Saturday, and I'm just bawling my eyes out. Like I feel like it was just I feel like it was just a culmination of that one week of trying to stay strong and you know for the funeral, whatever, and it was all happening, and we had to organize the funeral and 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 everything. And all of a sudden I'm on a flight from like Sydney to Korea and I'm just boiling my eyes out because I'm just like, I finally sit down. I actually have time to think about like what just happened in the last two months, you know? And, and I got there, I got to my connecting flight and I went to Kimberly. I was like, hold on. I was like, I don't think I can do this. I think I've got to go back. Like I just, it's, it's a lot for me to, you know, try My My mom's like, mom's just passed and now well, I'm, I'm going to try and compete in like, you know, a few days I was going on here and yeah, it was strange. And I, I just, I just felt, um, and then I started playing and I started training and I just felt she was with me. I just, I don't know how to describe it, but every time I just looked up, I could just tell she was with me and, and I was just, just feeling like a feeling. I looked up and I could see her face and I could tell she was like, just super happy that I was there. And so I, so I was great. Like I, I, in Korea, I was, I was actually pretty happy to be honest. And it, despite everything that was going on, I was actually quite happy. And because I felt there was so much guilt from me before when I was traveling when mum wasn't well. Mm. And I was like, oh, finally I can bring her on the road with me, you know? Oh, wow. yeah, so that yeah. was like such a big thing for me. Whereas I was in the US and I was, I could, I was just guilty being there. I was, tra when I was traveling before, I could, there was just always a bit of, should I be here or should I be home? Like, I don't know when's the last time I'm going to see her. So also I went to Korea and I just felt like she was with me. And there was like such a lift of guilt in a way where I was like, oh, okay, I can bring you on the road with me now. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good. So, so I felt like I was playing lighter. I felt that, um, that she was with me. If I had any moments of hesitation or, or anxiety or anything on court, I just looked at it and I was like, nah, like, we've got this, you know? And I felt like all of a sudden I was in a, like a team, a team environment, <laughs> if you will. And yeah, there was just, it was an amazing, amazing two weeks. And I lost the first week, uh, second round, lost to the, uh, the guy who ended up winning the tournament. And then the second week I went to Seoul and yeah, before every match, I remember I just like, my, my warm up routine was I just go outside, I just look up at the sky and I just look at her. I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't say anything, but I just look at her for like five, 10 minutes. And I'll be like, yeah, we've got this. Yeah, we've got mm -hmm. this. And, and I still look back at some messages during that week. And I was so many things, it was just meant to be. Like the day of the final, I was playing Ibing Wu and we played around one or 2 p.m. And the club, they served lunch. And then the lunch was like a, was like a Japanese like golden curry. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Like it's a Japanese curry, like katsu curry. And it was my favorite dish of mom's and they served it at lunch. And I was like, man, this is like, I was like, it's just meant to be like, I, I remember on my WhatsApp to like two family, we have a group chat with our family. And yeah, I took a photo of it and I was like, I sent it to the family. I was like, yeah, it's meant to be today, guys. Yeah, today's you know, the day. Mom, today's the day. Mom's with us. Like, you know, it's like my favorite meal that she cooks and they just cooked it for lunch for me before I'm about to play this match. 
And it was just one of those weeks where, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Mm. And it's definitely the, the best memories I've had on court. Um, but it was just so special to do that with mom after everything that had happened and to see me playing the final and seeing photos of just one of the toughest times in our lives for our family. And they're all in at our, at a Chinese restaurant. They've put like a slide, they've put like a, a projector on um, in the private room and they're all smiling watching my tennis match. That's amazing. Despite everything that we'd all gone through. And uh, yeah, it, and it just, yeah, it, it's amazing to, to see that I could provide such happiness um, and such memories in such a difficult time for our family. And yeah, they sent them through the photos and, you know, dad's smiling, you know, lost a lot of, a lot of, a lot of his life and, you know, he's smiling, my brother's smiling everyone's crying everyone's smiling like so many emotions but yeah just to yeah it was just it was so special that's beautiful that's really beautiful to listen to and also like interesting to look back at that whole journey that your mum and you went through to become christians and then where that led almost like to prepare you for that journey of her transition and then to be in korea and feel her presence and to have her there with you to almost like give you a different perspective on death to know that like she's always there. Yeah. No, even yeah. though she's not physically here. Like it, it and I think a lot of people don't have that experience mm. to 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 feel a connection with someone after they've passed and almost feel like they're there with you. And I think a lot of people could maybe view death in a different way if they had a bit more of a perspective on that on that. And that's why I really do like hearing about people like different people's religion and how they view death and how they view death as a transition moment to yeah. feel like they're still there and it's not end of the road yeah, exactly. even though they're not actually here with you yeah. they're still with you forever in a different way yeah no for sure like i still i i i find it hard um to like i don't i don't know how some people deal with death uh, without faith because it, it, it's just so painful mm. and and uh, it was really painful for our family as well and you know I remember my brother at times uh, he would say he would say yeah sometimes I'm jealous of your faith because mm. you, you sort of uh, and and for me it was you know it, it's just such a big thing for me that I know I know where I'm going I know like not that I'm excited to die and nothing like that, but it's like, but I'm so excited to see mom again. You yeah, know? And, yeah, I hear you, I hear you. And it's why as well, you know, I want to, I want to try and, I guess, you know, talk about my faith with my family as well, because you know, I want to be there with my brother, with with dad, with my brother's family, and mm -hmm. and it's you know, and I still invite dad to church every every Sunday. You know, I still am like, dad, come on, let's come to church, and yeah, I think that it's 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 such a beautiful thing knowing that when you have faith and you have your, your Christian, your Christian religion that man, we're all going to see each other again and it's all going to be great. And, and yeah, it is, it is such a big, big part of grieving for me mm. um, is, is having my faith and knowing that, yeah, it's just a transition and she's still, she's still with me and, and that she might not physically be here, but yeah, we will be, we will see each other again. So No, it, it's beautiful, man. I think it does help you move through those moments with a little bit more grace uh, yeah. and grieving, grieving that process in a little bit more of a, uh, a, a wholesome way mm. where you can navigate it uh, with a bit more understanding and compassion mm. with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was, um, yeah, beautiful to listen to. And I want to, uh, I, I guess I want to transition here to talk a little bit about where you've been this year so from all of that from that journey where did it lead you started going to the challenger circuit how did you make that transition to the challenger circuit how did you navigate being overseas on the tour for pretty much all of this year i, I think you've been away from almost the beginning of the mm -hmm. year to to right now and we're at the start of what is it august now i'm losing track <laughs> Um, so yeah, I would love to hear more about what it was like, some learnings, um, how it's been on, fully on the road for this amount of time and being fully on the challenger circuit. Yeah, it has been a, a transition for sure. So, you know, I, I, went, I went to futures and it all happened so quick, you know, I, sh I shot up through the ranks, uh, pretty quickly and, and then obviously, and then I won that challenger and it just looks like, you know, my, my career was just boom, like it was just going and 
And then, yeah, I guess the start of this year, I didn't start off very great. I, uh, I, I struggled with my results and a lot of it was, yeah, I just felt a lot of pressure to sort of keep that going. And I didn't play very freely. I kind of felt a lot of pressure to keep that going. Um, and uh, yeah, that was a fault of mine where I'd lost that. I'd lost that sense of, man, it's great. It's just great to be here. It's just great to compete. And it's just great that I can learn and I can, I just need to play matches and I need to learn from them and then improve. And it's not about, I need to get to the destination now, but as long as I'm on the journey, I'm on the right path, then, then I'm doing the right things. And I got, I got lost in that, to be honest. I got lost in the, man, I want it all happen now. I want it. I want the results now. I want to win, you know, so I can keep going. And I got, I got lost in that. And that's, that's an error of mine where I can now reflect on that and, mm -hmm. and sort of maybe catch myself before I kind of go down a spiral where I can say, Hey, Hey, just relax a little bit. Like, it's all, it's all good. You know, just, just get back to what are you about? Why are you back playing? And so, yeah, that, I think that's, that's on me to, to, to learn from that. And also, yeah, it is, it is extremely, it's been hard this year, uh, results wise, uh, the back end has been, has been good. I've, uh, I've got confidence in myself and I've had some good results recently and, and uh, yeah, I'm confident in my game that if I can keep pressing forward and be mentally fresh, ready to compete every week that I'm going to, I'm going to be okay. But it is so hard for Aussie tennis players to feel mentally fresh every week because, because home is just so far away yeah. where, you know, you're in Europe. Let's say you do a five, six week stint in Europe and you don't go that well and you feel like you need a recharge and you want to take a week off and, you know, you want to go train somewhere. At least for me, it's, it's, it's not that recharging unless I'm like back home and I'm in my own house and I'm driving my own car and things like that. It's just not that recharging to be just somewhere and training. I'm still living out of a suitcase, you know? So it is so hard for Aussie tennis players, I think to keep, to stay mentally fresh, unless they've got a base in Europe, unless they've got a base in us. That's where I think that, yeah, you've got to be a little bit smarter and maybe invest in doing something like that. Yeah. But yeah, it, so that's been a, such a learning curve for me of of trying to figure that out this yeah. year, and you know what my ideal schedule should look like, how many tournaments I should have on, how, like, when should I go back, and being really honest with myself of, you know, am I am I pushing myself too much here to be like, no, I'm good, no, I'm good, I'm gonna keep banging my head against this wall until I eventually break it. So yeah, it, it's brutal in that way because it's your first year, like probably officially on the tour just overseas hanging out um and playing continuously and you can get so caught up in it just saying yes to so many things disregarding when maybe you need a rest just like no nah, i need to keep going I need to keep grinding and then you feel the pressure of like backing up points or like yeah. earning a living getting the prize money and you can just get caught up in a whirlwind and not actually listen to your gut and listen to what's right for you. But you almost got to go through that in the initial stages of the tour yeah. to figure out your balance point. Um, I mean, everyone's different, but I'm someone that like I'll throw myself into something and then learn as I go. And as I get older, I'm trying to get smarter about how I do that. So I don't uh, do it to the detriment of myself and make big mistakes. Mm. Um, but there's so much, there's so much pressure. So how would you go about it differently? Um, let's say moving forward in the next year, what sort of things have you, have you like really consolidated and go like, no, 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 I think next time I'm going to do it like this or do it, um, in this way here, or maybe skip that or maybe go over here. Um, yeah. What's, what's been, what's been key in that area? I think it's, it's being extremely honest with myself of how I'm feeling before I play. So of how I'm feeling and not forcing myself because I am an all in or an all out sort of guy. And even if I'm feeling 70%, I'm going to try and give it my hundred percent. But sometimes it's, I need to be really open and honest with myself and maybe who I'm with to be like, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think you're running on empty here. or I think, you know, you're at 70% and you know what, let's, and especially at the, at least at the level that I'm playing at, I don't feel good enough to be playing at 70, 80% and winning these tournaments. Like I want to come to a tournament and in the mindset of I'm ready to win this tournament. 
and not I just want to get like second round or quarters. Like I want to come to a tournament and be like, yeah, I'm playing. I'm I'm ready to win this tournament. And if I'm not in that mindset, I don't want to be there. And that's I think a, a big learning thing for me of yeah, when I rock up to a, to a tournament, I want to be in the mindset of I am ready physically and mentally to win this tournament. And if I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing or I'm going home or I'm recharging or, you know, and, and that's probably the biggest thing for me. And the second thing as well is giving myself a bit of, a bit of grace in that. I know I'm 27, but I feel so young in my career. You know, I am 27, but you know, and I sometimes think that, man, I'm 27. Like I need a, I need a really, I need to start making it soon because I don't have any many years left. But also just, I don't know, I guess giving myself a bit of grace and be like, man, I have played, not played for a long time. Uh, it has happened. It has, it has happened pretty quickly. And man, if I started and I knew that this is where I would be, I would be so incredibly proud and like happy with myself and to not expect it to all happen so quickly and to really trust the process and to love what I'm doing and not count the wins and losses, but re- be really confident in how I want to play, mm-hmm. how I want to go about it and just know that I did it my way and and then let everything sort itself out because I need to be able to play because I think I'm I'm pretty talented. I think that I can play v- a variety, like a various styles of tennis and I need to be able to be free in pressure, free in thinking to be able to play that way and to play what seems right to me uh, against a certain opponent and if i'm too concerned about the wins and losses then i'm not going to have the freedom freedom to think clearly on i need to adapt to this certain play style to play this person so those are probably the two main things um that i've learned is just to yeah number one i guess to to not play a tournament unless i'm 100 percent ready to win the tournament or secondly i think the biggest thing as well is just to just realize that I am still quite young in my tennis career. Like yeah, I've only really course. been playing the challenger scene for a year mm. and, and that I'm still learning. I'm still navigating myself through this and I've, and that I think once I can figure it out that I think I'll be okay. So, and if I, and if the worst case is that I don't make it, I mean, that's all right. I mean, I told myself that when I started that, if the worst case scenario is that I don't miss it, but I can close that chapter in my book and say, you know what, I gave it a hundred percent. I can be happy with myself in that. Then yeah, it's all good. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think um, being on the tour, because it, it is so fresh for you and guys at the same age of potentially being on tour for seven, eight years and you're basically first year mm. on the tour. So it's like, they know what they like. They know the conditions of different places. They know how to work their schedule. So you've got to be a little bit more compassionate with yourself to go like, well, I've just started here. Like I, I don't feel like I have that physical wear and tear like some of the other guys because I'm just still feeling like I, 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 I'm so fresh. And you haven't had that experience. So with more time, I think you would be getting more experience and know how you're going to do it a little bit better and differently going into the next bunch of tournaments. Like what sort of things have you learned in terms of like how to schedule better, where you would potentially go next time, which places you would avoid? Because that's stuff like people don't really think about mm. when it comes to the tour. Yeah, especially. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that, you know, I, I, I particularly like playing in Asian countries uh, because I just love the food there. I love the culture. I feel I could lose first round there and I just had a great time. And, you know, whereas I feel like maybe some other places in the world where... I just don't feel as home as much. Um, And if there's, so if there's like a decision to play between, you know, Asia or somewhere else, I'm probably going to lean towards Asia. And if there's, if there's uh, conditions now that I've been to some tournaments, um, I know if the conditions are playing slow, fast, bouncy, not bouncy, what bowls are sort of using. And I generally like faster conditions. So I guess, yeah, I think I'd probably lean more towards that if I had some choices. So a bit more, I feel a bit more educated on that. Mm. Uh, for next year as well so yeah i think going into next year i think that that's probably a big thing that i'm con- gonna consider and not do also not do you know 10 11 weeks straight of tournaments where um yeah i might gas out but then i'm just gonna yeah keep playing just for the sake of playing so yeah spot on that makes complete sense um 
I want to give some insight to people maybe wondering the difference between the futures and maybe the jump to challenger level. What are some of the key differences um, in that transition and what happens at maybe a challenger level that, or what do you observe at a challenger level that's quite different to future? Um, so yeah, I'd say that the, the biggest differences are, are you talking about the plays or are you talking about the organization? I think the, all of it. Yeah. Okay. So I guess like, so futures I would say are, I mean, depends on where you are, uh, but I'd say in general, the challenges are a lot well organized, a lot more, yeah, better organized. You know, they they provide bowls every day. Um, they provide towels, bowls, transport to and from the hotel to the courts. There's five nights accommodation paid for oh, for okay. you. And yeah, I guess that- I didn't they, know that. Yeah, so they and then sometimes you know they'll do a lot of times it's breakfast included. Sometimes they'll even do lunch included as well, and everything's just a lot more professional. And then you sort of go another level up. We go to the two fifties, and then you get all of a sudden you get six nights included. You get laundry provided, airport pickups, and yeah, then all you got to do is just literally just focus on playing. And then you just you text the number say, "Can I get a pickup or a transport to and from here?" They're like, "Yep, no worries." So. Yeah, I think that at the future level, yeah, the, the tournaments are you got to pay for your accommodation, you got to pay for transport, you got to pay for everything. And then the prize money is also very bad. Mm. And it's just, yeah, if you're looking at money wise, it's just not feasible. Uh, yeah. And and then the challenge and then the higher up you go, the more they pay for, but like, you probably need it less because the, the money's a lot more, but they end up looking after a lot more. So, yeah. So you essentially got to get out of that futures pit and get yourself established at a challenger level. And then once you're there, you're maybe more breaking even because yes. you're not spending so much money on accommodation because that's where a lot of people are losing so much money. You just pay for your airfares to, to and from and then you get help with like transport to and from courts. Yes, yes. And then some help with food. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's big. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because like I guess with the futures, it's it's – it's just not feasible and and as well it's it's easy not easy but you can get stuck there because because i will say that it's it's so tough because you are you are thinking a lot about how can i save money how can i save money by man can i room with these people okay we're going to get an airbnb and then we're going to hire a car and then that like you're organizing you're organizing so much just for like one week of tournament or two weeks of tournaments and and then you know you're you're counting the money and and you're trying to just not be bleed you're just trying to stop the bleeding <laughs> right you're just trying to stop the bleeding <clears throat> and then everyone else is sort of in that mindset where you're thinking about the money and then and then it's you, you play so tight because you know if you win you can afford a nice dinner tonight or like you know <laughs> like like I'm not okay that's a bit extreme but it's like but you just know that every match is going toward is like it's just so big you know it's just so big and 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 then I think that's why as well a lot of people get tight in the futures because you're actually playing for to put food on the table like at, at some tournaments because it's so expensive to get there the accommodation is expensive everything's expensive and everyone's just fighting just to survive honestly and it's and no wonder why like it's hard for people to to play freely when the environment itself is not very conducive of that because you're yeah you're literally you're scrambling for for to, to survive is that why you did so well do you think because you were coming at it from a different angle, played so free against so many guys that you reckon were playing tight because of those exact reasons you were talking about? Honestly, honestly, I think it, it, it did. I think I, I came and I didn't think about money at all. Like I, I sort of came in with the expectation that I'm probably going to lose money, but I want to go and I want to give it a crack. I want to do my best. And if I lose money, but I, I, I give it my absolute all, then I can live with that. And yeah, that lightness of my of that lightness in that attitude and that thinking and obviously you know it wasn't just the mindset it was the hard work and i guess the talent and stuff behind that but i will say that that mindset helped me a lot in that i guess initial period to be able to go through the futures because i had no pressure i mean i was the hunter like i was going after people i was going after you know you've got that your ranking is 300 400 i want to see how i shape up to you you know and 
Yeah, if I lose, what? Who am I? Like, I've got no ranking. Like, yeah, what? so 100%. what? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then all of a sudden, I guess that mentality changed a little bit when all of a sudden I was, you know, two hundred or whatever, and and I felt like people really wanted to play me. And then I was like, oh no, I want to defend my like ego, yeah. my dignity, you know. And then that yeah. was a bit of a learning curve for me as well to not to be able to you know put that down and say, yeah, you know, mate, mate, you want to you want to beat me? Like, let's go, let's go yeah. at it. You win, dude, too good, well played, man. You know, and yeah. to be able to have that mentality as well because. It is such a thing where, yeah, if you're like the lower ranked player, you're like so keen to play that guy because, man, there's no pressure. If I lose, of course, like you're supposed to win, like, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I think me coming in with that attitude of not of going after people, of like being a hunter, not worried about finances. And I just played. I was just, I was so free, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I wasn't tight at all in any of my, in any of my futures matches, not tight at all. And yeah, uh, yeah so I think that really helped. Amazing. You played a few times on the ATP tour. You mentioned that 250 um, in Melbourne, the first one. Um, and then you've played in Mallorca recently and then Newport where you got your first ATP tour win in the main draw and then played Mackenzie McDonald and lost a, a tight, tight two-setter. What was that like? What's uh, You touched on the differences between the like, ATP 250 and then Challenger. What was the difference between the two and, and what was your experiences like playing at that level? Yeah, it was amazing. I uh, obviously, it's just so cool to be at that tournament uh, around these people, around really, I guess, professional, absolute veterans. And everyone's really, everyone's actually quite nice. Everyone's really nice. I think they all know that, you know, it's a tour. We've got to be friendly with each other and we try and help each other out. And it is, it is such a, a great environment. And I do, I will say that the, the people that are, you know, higher up ranked, like they just seem to have like entourages with them. Like they just got like a physio, a fitness trainer, a coach, two coaches, you know. And uh, yeah, it can be pretty pretty intense. And and I I felt like I learned the, the only thing I really the only thing I the main thing I learned was that man, these guys they're not they're not superhuman. Like they they are humans. I mean, they get tired. They you know they they get tired. They 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 play really well and. Everyone can play well, but I think the experience I feel like came through a little bit, and I didn't I didn't walk away being like, man, these guys are unbelievable. I was like, yeah, like they're good, obviously, um, they're good, and but it's just, man, I think if you if you if you go up and you're able to play freely against these guys, anything can happen. You play the big moments and you don't, and you back yourself in and you and you put it, you play it on your terms. Anything's possible, and you know, I, 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 um, lost every single match. I like, I, if I lost, it was pretty close. If I won, it was close as well. I mean, I played books and I was, I was a set point down in the second set and then mm -hmm. I won it. And then, and, and then I won that match. And then against McKenzie, I had two set points in the second set and then he saved him with two aces oh, wow, and then okay. he, and then he won the, and then he won the match. So there's not much in it. I guess it's just recognizing those key moments and just trying to make a slightly better decision or yeah, being able to, you know, did I play, did I make the right decision there? Yes or no? Yes. All right, don't worry about it. You missed it? Don't worry about it. At least you went for it. And and yeah, it's just on the, and I think you see, unless you're a Djokovic or unless you're an absolute, you know, freak, you just see a different winner every week. Like you don't see the same people winning the same tour. Like at the Challenger Tour or the ATP Tour, there's not the same winners. Uh, and that's because there is just not much in it. Like there's just just a few key moments in every match where the winner is going to be decided in those key moments. And it's just trying to make the best decision tactically in that in those moments. And then, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, you do see that such fine margins at that level. Yeah. yeah, and it's crazy to think that it's just literally like a couple decisions here and there. Yeah, that can literally shape the match or yeah, um, yeah define a match. Where to from here? Wow, I, I guess it's. Uh, I just want to keep going. I mean, I, I just want to keep learning. I want to keep. I want to keep going down this journey. I'm absolutely loving it and obviously the goals there's always like the the top 100 goal in the back of my mind that you know i guess if you're you know if, uh, i love reading and you know i think it's a good analogy in atomic habits where he talks about you know you can look at the scoreboard as much as you want but it doesn't really it doesn't change how the match is going and 
So it's good to have, you know, these goals and things like that, but it's more about the systems in place that you put, that you put in, uh, that you have that will ultimately get you there. So I guess I've got goals in the back of my mind, but I am mainly just focused on myself, what I'm doing daily to be the best version of myself or, you know, the, what systems do I need to put in place week or what people do I need to put around me to be able to make this, um, to, to be able to help me to where I want to go and to love what I'm doing. And yeah, I guess it's a constant journey for me and I'm still discovering what works best for me, but I'm... Uh, I'm loving it and I guess I I just want to keep playing and and just see where I can go mm. uh, and I'm excited because I, I, I honestly not really I'm not playing tennis I think Ash Barty is a good case for this because she gave up tennis when she was number one in the world so it was clear to her that being number one in the world wasn't the reason why she was playing tennis it's you know I think maybe I, I, don't, I don't know her personally so I'm not going to speak for her but I think that is a good suggestion as to that's not why she was playing tennis. You know, I think she wanted to play tennis because she wanted to provide for a family or she wanted to have the financial freedom to do whatever she wanted after tennis. And for her, it was just a job to, to make money. I don't, I don't want to speak for her, but I think that the biggest thing for her, it was, it was to not be number one in the world. And for me, I'm pretty similar like that in a way that I'm not really playing tennis because I want to be number one in the world. I want to, you know, make make like a big put my mark on tennis or anything like that i mean i'm playing tennis because i love it and because i want to make friends with people because i want to travel because i want to just absolutely i think it builds so much character playing tennis because it is such a brutal sport and i think that there's no better way to to really prepare myself for life you know after tennis than going through this and you know being able to work hard be resilient you know be be organized and it's just my my calling and i just i just want to see where it to where it takes me and if i don't ever really end up hitting the top 100 or whatever mark that um you know a lot of people people really strive for then i'm okay with that mm. and and i guess it's 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 being all right in that and yeah i guess i'm just i'm just really really just trying to improve myself daily and that's my biggest goal i guess yeah sounds like you're really coming back to a sense of lightness and a, and a healthy perspective behind it all after maybe some challenging experiences being on the tour this year and maybe losing your way mm. uh, in the perspective and how you're looking at it yeah because i feel like you're really setting yourself up for some success if you're looking at it in that way and no i wish you nothing but the best thanks so some advice Oh, so what advice would you give to anyone aspiring tennis players at a lower level towards a futures level challenger level the really wanting to to get to the levels that you've got and beyond is there any kind of pearls of wisdom or things that stand out for you that you think are important to hear i think the the biggest uh, advice I would say is to think about your why. So think about your why in tennis as to, as to why you're playing, because I think that that's ultimately what will drive you to play and ultimately what will bring you back when you go off course or you lose yourself a little bit. Always, always just really think about your why in tennis. Why are you playing and why are you putting yourself through hours of training or why are you putting yourself through man, you, you've lost four weeks in a row, first round, like, why are you playing? And I think that that question and really, really brings you back and, and puts, puts things into perspective. And I would really say that that's my biggest advice um, for tennis players, I guess, up and coming, if you're a junior and everything like that. But, and also to, and also to, Use the people around you and to create, I guess, a, a good network because, man, people are so willing to help out. Like if you if you go one step for other people, um, yeah, and just remember, I guess, like who helped you out and, and to just surround yourself with good people. And I think that that is, yeah, really, really important. And I'm, I'm uh, yeah, just super grateful for all the people that have been on my tennis journey and ha who has helped me out immensely. I've learned so much about myself. Um, and yeah, I just, I'd just say that that's probably my biggest advice to, mm. 
to yeah old tennis plays yeah that's rock solid i mean i think there's a saying that um a man who knows his why can endure anyhow mm. and yeah. uh yeah i think that's that's rock solid mm. and just want to express my gratitude and appreciation for you uh as a friend and someone that is, is inspiring me my journey and thanks again for coming coming down to thank the, you so today much and that afternoon glow Did you see that afternoon glow on his yeah. face through the window man it was, it was like golden hour on his face <laughs> you know it, it came up when he was talking about his mom i took How? a photo i took a photo it <laughs> came out when he was talking about his mom i was like no way no way no, no because been, i mean it's, it's been crazy stuff like that's happened with uh you know when it was when it was raining when it was um it was like really wet in adelaide i remember and it was really wet in adelaide i remember and my um there was a day that my mom was being transferred from uh the like the the like her ashes were in like a little pigeonhole and then it was got moved to like her her grave and then like on that day like it was so sunny that she was getting moved and stuff and then my brother was like yeah it's just crazy like you know you're just when it's been it's been so wet here lee but then like today it's just like sunny for this like i don't know yeah that stuff yeah you can't explain it the same thing happened with my nono a couple of weeks ago it was like raining in the morning and then we went to the to the cemetery for the burial and then the sun just came out and same. it was just like same yeah it's yeah. crazy it's crazy you just um yeah life and the world works in mysterious ways mm. legend thanks so much absolute so pleasure much. It was great. Thanks for having me. Next time, we'll go again. <laughs> yeah.